我叫刘冰，你们欢迎来 Becoming China. So I wanted to take a few minutes today to kind of synthesize my sojourn here in the Middle Kingdom. I've been here eight months. I've seen a lot, and I've learned even more. And I want to be able to take that experience and share it with everyone here. My audience is mostly Western, kind of bridging that East-West gap, bringing everyone together. And you know, when I first found out that I'd be coming to China, I had no idea what to expect. You know, with Russia, different story. I have a bachelor's degree in Russian. I speak it. I live in Voronezh. I've been a student there. I understand it, but China, dude, nothing. So I went to the library, found every book I could, started to learn the language a little bit. A few months, I was here in the Middle Kingdom. I knew how to say ni hao, xi xi, zai jian. Three words in my Lexus. Now, in my mind, I thought I was a very enlightened Westerner because I was like, Mao Zedong, he's done it over with. Showing a picture of Mao with China is like showing a picture of Nixon with America. Past is past, future is now. So I was thinking more like ping pong, kung fu. You know, everyone's maybe got CD players and little crappy cars and rickshaws. And I got here and I was totally blown away. No, man. Everyone's got an iPhone. Everyone's got the high-speed internet. Everyone's got a nice SUV. Credit cards are a thing here now, so not only are Westerners suff suffocating because of credit card debt, that's made its way to the East as well. It is a totally 21st century city. Let me put that down there. 21st century city, Beijing, the capital. Whenever you kind of get outside the main Beijing, you get more into the real China. You know, it's like getting out of the real America that is LA or New York. And you get into the real America that is rural Indiana. Maybe a little different. Maybe just a little bit. So I understood that being in Beijing is not necessarily the true Chinese experience. It's an international city by design. Everything is in English. Most people speak at least a little bit of English. If they can't speak it, they can read and write it. Foreigners from all over the world come to Beijing to do business. So I made sure to get over here, limit my time with Westerners, get off Facebook, stop reading the news, get a Chinese teacher, and really do my best to assimilate into Chinese culture. So with the Chinese language itself, now I gotta say, I am a language nerd. I love languages. They're awesome. I speak a couple myself. I want to learn a bunch more. And so whenever I did find out I was coming to China, learning Chinese was number one on my list. So one of the big things about assimilation, at least for me, is I wanted to be a good immigrant. There's so many people back in the States, they see some, let's just say, some Latin American, maybe from El Salvador, right? He's coming into a McDonald's. He's covered in dirt, he's got his work boots on, he's obviously gonna break, and he goes up and he tries to order a hamburger. He tries in English, but he can't, because he spends all this time working with other Spanish speakers, probably either living alone or living with his family, who probably speaks Spanish. The only time he ever gets out to speak English is at places like McDonald's. And a lot of people say, oh, well, if I was an immigrant, I would speak the language because I'm so good, that's probably why you are the one person who's not fat, lazy, unmotivated, and is exactly where they want to be in their life, because you are different. So I decided that I really wanted to take that to heart, do my best to assimilate, and that meant learning Chinese. Now Chinese is a tonal language, which means as a Westerner, no matter how hard you try to say anything, no one will ever understand you. There are four tones, the rising tone, the neutral tone, the falling tone, and what I call like a dip tone. So let's just look at the word ma. Ma, 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 ma. That's the same word in four different tones, giving it four different meanings. Ja, 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 ja. Four words, four different meanings. Wo, 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 wo. All different. I've been doing it eight months, so I kind of get the tones now. People still don't understand me. Tom and Putin will don't war. Dong, war, 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 war,
我和希望说中文，我不能，不能，他们听不懂我。我是老外，老外不知道这个。对 ，My Chinese is coming along, but everything I said there. A native speaker would probably understand maybe 70% of that, and then they go, "Shema," and I would sit there feeling like an idiot because even though I got a Chinese teacher, did everything I was supposed to, progress is slow. At eight months of Chinese study, I'm probably sitting at an A2 competency according to the Common European Framework of Reference. Common European Framework Reference. Common European Framework of Languages. A2 competency, maybe A1, probably A2.1. But you can find any expat in Beijing, especially Beijing, because it is an international city. You can find a family who's lived here five years, speaks no Chinese. I wanted to put an end to that. I wanted to be a good immigrant and a good ambassador for the West. Honestly, though, the hardest part about integrating. Into Chinese life wasn't the language, and it wasn't the culture. It was the pollution. It was the pollution, man. It's insane. December, they called it the smog apocalypse. We literally had to shut down the school for three days because regional government said that the air outside was so full of PM 2.5, particulate matter 2.5, the stuff that your nose and your lungs don't filter out, that the air. Toxic to breathe, the poisonous smog. Now I got here in November, and that's when it really started to hit. So not knowing what I was doing, not being able to talk to anyone, not understanding what was going around me, and not being able to go outside to clear my head, I lost my mind a little bit. I kind of went into an existential despair. But that's kind of the point. That's why I'm here. A lot of people look at these adventures and they go, "Oh yeah, you know, they go out and they do all these cool things and blah 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 blah." It can be if you're a fool. Traveling isn't about having a good time. Traveling is about isolation. Traveling is about self knowledge. Traveling is comparing yourself to others and understanding what makes you you. It's getting down away from everything you know and then finding out. What's true and eternal about yourself? What will you stand for? What won't you stand for? What do they do that you don't do? What do they do that you want to do? You know, the Buddhists say that the only way to really find yourself is by comparing yourself to others. Not now, he's better than me way, or I'm better than him way. But that's black. That's white. That's light. That's dark. That's heavy. That's light. That's wet. That's dry. How do you know if you're kind if you've only been around yourself? Maybe you don't know you're kind until you've been around someone who's incredibly ungenerous. Maybe you consider yourself a really funny guy, but you don't know until you've been some around someone who's absolutely hilarious. By seeing the differences in others, you understand yourself more, and that is what traveling's all about. So I want to say first off that I love my job and I love what I do. I get to help spread the gift of language to the world. I get to help people come together and communicate in a common tongue, to get over differences and really understand what it means to be human together. Tower of Babel, right? I like to think that I'm one of the people helping to rebuild it, spreading my mother tongue across the world. You know, the gift of language is awesome, but you know, just like the Tao, it rests in low places and it nurtures all life. But most men won't go there, and that's kind of how it is being an ESL professional. I want to I want to put that in quotes there, professional. Because really, a lot of the time, the only thing that you need to teach ESL is to be a native speaker, and that's it. So if you combine the incredibly low requirements of getting into the field, plus traveling, which translates to escapism, you get a lot of folks coming from the very bottom of the bucket. So a lot of times I'm hesitant to tell people here that I teach English as a second language because they look at me and go, ah, so do you have a drinking problem or are you just a really big loser? Neither. 
just really love languages, want to help people understand each other. For example, Beijing understood this, that they were getting a lot of really low quality people, especially in China, because foreigners are a curiosity here. People will literally come up to you on the street and be like, hey, let me take a sub with you. Great, great, great. They're very curious, and the Chinese people are very friendly as well. They are genuinely interested in learning from foreigners. This is a country that does not have a history of migration. But that's a die for another story. So for example, with these ESL professionals, my company hired a woman who had worked in the fashion industry her entire life. No classroom experience, no second languages, and didn't know the difference between a vowel and a consonant. Beijing understands that that is not what they exactly want to be teaching their children. The Chinese are very smart. Like back in the day, back in the Middle Ages, the Chinese really, really, really liked Italian handmade clocks. So the Italians are like, yeah, we'll just keep trading with you, trading with you, trading with you. You like our clocks, we like your silk, great. Eventually China's like, yeah, wait a second. We're just gonna hire a bunch of these Italian clock makers. We're gonna set them up in a nice palace. We're gonna make a factory. And these Italians are gonna make Italian clocks in China. And then they're gonna teach these Chinese craftsmen how to make Italian clocks in China. So now the Chinese are making these clocks and they've got no reason to trade. They've totally just adopted the idea, cinified it, and now they make it on their own. Sound familiar? Like anything they've been doing now? It's been going on for centuries. They're really, really smart. They think long term. It's crazy. But Beijing was like, yeah, we can't have these low level foreigners coming in, so they bumped up their requirements. You had to be 24. You had to have a TESOL. You had to have a bachelor's degree. And you had to have two years classroom experience. Sounds really great. Except for, this is still a developing country, second largest economy in the world, but still a developing country. So they were getting no applicants, so the supply for teachers just totally shriveled up, like overnight. So eventually they had to drop it back down to, if you speak it, come on down. So you get a lot of shady types, which is one of the reasons uh, being here in China, I've avoided the bars pretty heavily. I've avoided a lot of other Westerners just because I know that they're not here for the same reason I'm here. I came to China with the express purpose of A, understand, understanding and assimilating into the Chinese culture, and B, increasing my professional skills as an ESL educator. And those things don't add up with most of the other foreigners in Beijing. But the question I get asked the most is about personal freedoms in China. I'm sure you've heard the rumors, it's a communist state, so it must be inherently bad. And I'm sure you already have pretty strong opinions on censorship and one-party governments. So I'll stay away from all that. But what I will say is that there are some unexpected benefits of these different systems. So, for example, let's look at the censorship of the press. The Chinese don't necessarily value the same thing as the Westerners. One thing that they value incredibly so is stability. And with that stability, you can't have so many people trying to rock the boat and change it. In order for things to be stable, things need to be calm, things need to be, need to be controlled. You have to have a very strong box to hold all the apples. So that means that some stories don't make it to the light of the day. And some of that is bad, some of it can be good. For example, last fall in San Latoon, which is where the foreign embassies are, it's where a lot of expats, foreigners, they go to drink because there's bars there. Bars aren't a big thing in China. That's a Western phenomenon. Here, it's mostly restaurants. People bond over food rather than alcohol. Or alcohol over food. So there's this guy and he saw a French man and his Chinese wife walking down the street. He took out his samurai sword and he stabbed them both, yelling, I hate Americans, even though the guy was French and his wife was Chinese. So the woman died at the hospital and the man survived. If you want to call it surviving, he had his newly married wife die in his arms at the hands of some madman. But there was a total media blackout. I know in the States, oh my god, CNN, Fox, they would be sensationalizing that. MSNBC would be having a field day. You know, looking at the guy. Is he mentally ill? What's the country come to? No respect for the victims. No respect for their families. And a couple months later, it was quite released. They had a very touching editorial on a... I think it was the Beijinger. About how this, this man's life had basically ended before it began. And 
she was lost forever. So with the censorship, you know, some things good can come out of it. Some things really bad can come out of it. Don't misquote me here. And then, because it is the one party, they have absolute authority to do whatever they need to do. And so that means that the very next day, they send an armed guards to San Latoon. The Public Security Bureau just bumped up security so there'd be no copycat incidents. And that's another great thing about keeping that out of the press. Not a lot of people knew about it, so there were not a lot of copycats. Because anti-foreign sediment, you know, has traditionally been a thing. There have been two opium wars. Hong Kong has been in its own particular situation for a long time. Taiwan, I won't even get into that. And as for the one-party system, while in America, we're going back and forth, back and forth, can't decide on anything, the sequester 2013 budget crisis, two parties couldn't come to an agreement, so the entire country shut down. I remember because I was living abroad in Russia, and to hear that my government literally shut down because we couldn't make a simple compromise, I felt shame. That's what I felt. I felt embarrassed of my country. It hurt. A lot. Here in China, they don't have that problem. They have the one party. What he says, goes. We have a five-year plan. We're not deviating from it. No matter what. I don't care if we have to move your house, you peasant. We're building a dam here. It's for the good of the country. Five-year plan. I don't make the decisions. This five-year plan makes the decisions. In that aspect, the stability and they have predictable growth. They brought millions of people out of extreme poverty in the last few years. Back in the 70s, they are starving to death. Now they have the second largest economy in the world. Per capita income, it's still much lower than the developed world, but it's only a matter of time, especially with culture of decline. That is the West. I hear stories, because like I said, I'm on Facebook having watched the news, and every time I hear a story from a coworker or someone on Skype or an email, Yes, you can receive emails in China. They don't block them. I always wonder, it's like a game of two truths and a lie. What do you really believe? Which? I hear that Chinese businessmen tried to buy like the New York Times. They already bought the AMC theaters and the legendary movie company. So maybe that discernment, what's really going on, what should I believe is going to become much more important in the coming decades. By being a foreigner, by default, I am not part of the mainstream. By definition, to be a foreigner is to be an outsider. Cutting off all my Western influences and not being able to fully integrate myself into these Eastern influences, I have been perpetually trapped, suspended between two worlds, two languages, and two cultures. In that isolation, you really do start to ask yourself questions and you do start to wonder what you really do value. And I understand that different customs, different cultures, different people, different traditions. But the idea of, how can I say, the individual, I don't want to get too political here, the individual, is not really something that exists in China. It's a very communal society. I was talking to one of my Chinese co-workers and she said that if you have a group of ten Chinese, Maybe two of them will be different than the rest, but eight of them will be more or less the same person. However, she has extensive contact with foreigners, being an English teacher by trade. She says that each American that she's met has been a totally different person. One of the first questions a Chinese may ask, Wushu Shui? Wushu Lu Ping? Lu being my family name, Ping being my given name. I am my family. Family is very important here. Family is incredibly important here. In America you just say, my brother. Chinese you can't say that. You have to say, well the gugu, well the didi. My gugu is my older brother, my didi is my little brother. My jue jue, my mei mei. Well the, well the nai nai or well the wai po. Wai Po is my maternal grandmother. Nian Ye is my maternal grandmother. No, the other way around. Dudes are more important in China. Don't forget that. Dudes are more important. That being said, every Chinese dude is totally henpecked by his woman just because there are not a lot of girls around so they can be incredibly picky. I had a friend who's dating a Chinese girl and she broke up with him because he would only buy her one hat and not two hats. 
Real story, real story. They do this thing called Sao Jin, which is like this weird manipulation deal. You're like, uh, if we were on a bridge and I fell off the bridge and your mother fell off the bridge, who'd you save? Well, the correct answer to that question is you would save your girlfriend because your father would save your mother. Obviously. Obviously. Duh. But they'll do stuff like, oh, I really want Starbucks. Well, honey, there's not a Starbucks around for five kilometers. If you don't give me Starbucks, it means you don't love me. <laughs> and then the guy runs off to get Starbucks, and the woman sits there. <laughs> She's usually happy about it. So the idea of standing up for yourself, not a big thing. Understandably, people that stand up for themselves, an old adage in this part of the world is, the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. For real. I had it explained wonderfully to me like this, about how the individual is perceived. So let's pretend we have a panda, and China gives this panda to the United States to put on display in its zoo, right? And let's say that that panda has a baby. Well, if the China belongs to panda, then the China, the baby, <laughs> the panda's baby also belongs to China. Just logic 101, you know? So Chinese pandas in a foreign land, have a baby panda, that baby panda is Chinese. So if two Chinese left for America and then they have a child in America, that child is not an American. That child is an overseas Chinese just waiting to be repatriated back to the motherland. Keeping in mind that human rights are a pretty recent development and humankind's development, it wasn't back into the, the mid-1700s that real human rights were totally being decided. You know, we had like Cyrus the Great freeing the slaves back in what, 300, 300 BC, 380, something weird like that. The natural idea of natural laws turning into eventually human rights, that is a Western phenomenon, and Westerners have used that to oppress people that aren't other Westerners, as we've seen in Africa, China, Middle America, basically anywhere where people don't look white. So it's still got a long way to go before it comes to China. Right now, the right that they do have, and this is something that we don't have in the West, is a Chinese right is you have the right to make money. Because for so long, people lived in such destitute poverty, whenever they got a taste for it, they wanted to make sure that everyone had a chance to do it. So, I want to say thank you. Thank you for watching. And I really do hope that I was able to effectively share some of my own personal experience with you about China, its people, the Middle Kingdom in general. I want to end the video by saying that, you know, China, they're not the bad guys. And yeah, no government is perfect, America's included. But if you talk to the average Chinese, what do they want? They want to take care of their old, they want friendship between nations, and they want the world to work together to make this place a better place for all of us to live. I think that's something we can all get behind. You know, the next time you see a, a commercial where Mao Zedong is hanging up his little red book, realize that Mao's era is over. You can be afraid of anyone, be afraid of Xi Jinping. He's pretty alright too. He took out the tigers, he's clearing out corruption. Take that at face value. Anyway. Xi Xi, what's your looping? Now I'm a gentle lady, not a dude. Hi! <laughs>